So I was asked today to speak about um, skin, my research in skin disease uh, in scleroderma and to present to you some of the uh, hopefully exciting results that we have discovered um, since beginning this in um, So the overview, I was going to talk about how we currently measure skin disease in scleroderma and how we're hoping to measure it in the future. So we're uh, planning on using more, more um, scientific approaches, including measuring gene expression in the skin, and then um, the discoveries that we've made using skin as a biomarker. And a biomarker is just a measurement of the disease, so that, uh, a biological <coughs> measurement of disease. So we're going to first start off with um, Showing you some data how we identified patients that are most likely to improve during microfentanyl or cell cell, as Dr. Marga had mentioned earlier. And then to show you a slide where we have some information about um, what is not the appropriate length of, of therapy. We don't know what is, how long we should treat patients with MMF, but we know that two years is probably not enough for many of you. And then we are going to present some data. Uh, where we've shown that we have a think we have a good way to identify patients that are most, most likely to improve during MMF and to identify potential new treatments. So there's a lot of exciting research that uh, has been conducted using skin. And uh, now I'm gonna <laughs> really do need need those slides. <laughs> I worked so hard on that. <laughs> what a pity. So if you go to the next slide, where I have the three pictures of the people, um, you can see that there's the type 1 and the type 2, which Dr. Fogali Bostwick had mentioned is, are the limited group. So those are patients with the blue um, annotates where the skin involvement would be. So there's the type 1 with just the foot and the hand and the face fibrosis. And then the type 2 limited group with uh, up to the elbow, up to the knee and the face. And then the diffuse group is, uh, as the name implies, those patients can have skin fibrosis all over the bodies. But as Dr. Fagali Bostwick mentioned, well, all of these patients have, thank you, the, have, the, have the systemic form of the disease. So that's a big source of confusion for patients when they say, when I tell them that they have the limited form of disease, but they're still at risk for having internal organ involvement. That always comes as a surprise to patients because they're thinking by having the limited form of disease, they're off the hook. But that's not the case. All, the, all these patients can have um, internal organ involvement, as we've learned uh, today. So currently, we're, we're pinching the skin with our thumbs. Um, on 17 areas of the body, and you uh, have all this had all had this test performed by Dr. Corman or Dr. Varga or myself. So we pinch the 17 areas and we come up with a score, a total of 51. So zero is normal skin where you can pinch and hold yourself um, by your skin, and a zero or a three is when your skin is so thickened that you, in spite of trying to pinch, you can't pinch any skin, and that's the. The, the most severe thickness. So we come up with this and we keep track of it in the computer and so each time I see you I do the skin assessment and so we can have a sense of how the skin disease is progressing or regressing. But this, as you can imagine, is not very scientific. A lot of things can make the pinch test difficult to, to do. Um, if you have swelling or if you're overweight um, if you've had disease for a very long time and your skin is no longer thickened but very, very thin and it's really just skin on bone, this test isn't a very good test for that. So the question I had when I entered uh, John Varga's laboratory back when I was a fellow was, is there a more scientific method for measuring uh, skin disease and scleroderma? And, I, and I'd like to think that there is in this day and age. So I started doing skin biopsies, which I <coughs> Many of you have felt fallen victim too. <laughs> um, but I've had six of my own, as my skin scars will will show. So I would never do anything to you that I wouldn't do to myself. And so we do the the skin biopsies on the arm and the back, and you can see how the instrument here um, go. This is the instrument that I use, and so it pokes down into the skin and it removes a, a small circle of skin about the size of a pencil eraser. And we use that to isolate the RNA from the whole biopsy. That's how we started doing it. We would take the whole biopsy and grind it up and get the RNA from it. 
Now, most recently, um, we're starting to isolate RNA from the actual cells in the skin. So we're taking the biopsy and sorting the cells, the different cell types out, and then doing uh, experiments on those. So that's the, the newest development, and, and that's one that I'm excited about, but is the topic for a different discussion for a different day. So as Dr. Fagali Bostwick had shown, I showed a little bit differently, but it's a similar idea. So you've got the four base pairs. Here's your DNA. I like to think of the DNA as the menu. All the different proteins in your body that your body can produce is the menu. And then the RNA is what your body orders. So the proteins that it needs um, in order to keep you healthy, um, that's the RNA, that's the gene expression. And then the proteins are what the body delivers. So those are the meal. That's actually what's brought to your table. So that's the that's way that I think of it. It helps me keep it straight. So what we do with the skin, we obtain your skin biopsies, and we grind up all the tissue, and we isolate the RNA. And then we take RNA from a sample, from a control sample, and that's pooled RNA from 17 different cell lines. And we label those with different colored uh, tags. We mix <coughs> them together, and then we hybridize them, or we paint them, smear them over a slide, and we let that cook for 24 hours. And then we take a picture of it, and it basically the different colored dyes light up in terms of, so each one of these little boxes, each one of these little circles is a gene that we're measuring. And so we can come up with a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, of all the genes and what your level of that particular gene is, the expression of that gene in your skin. So it becomes a nice spreadsheet of 30,000 genes and uh, all the values for that are, that are in your particular skin compared to a healthy person's control. <coughs> and so you can see here, if this is a control, you have, the, the number might be 200, um, if you are the patient and your level is 10,000, we take the ratio of that and it, take the log base two. So everything is in log base two for the mathematicians in the room. And you can see that if you're equal to the control, it'll show up as a black dot. And if you're lower than the control here, um, it'll show up as a green dot. And so we just use this. We, take, we use a computer to basically color code the numbers because it's impossible to interpret 30,000 numbers in rows and you know maybe 100 or 200 patients in all the columns. So we just convert these numbers into colors and then we can see. So every single one of these columns here is one of your skin biopsies that you've given me over the years. And so we can see these are all the genes. So there's 30,000 of these genes. So we can take a snapshot of it and see, well, there's a group of patients here that have a lot of expression of this gene shown in red. And then they have very low expression of these genes down here shown in green. So it just, it, it's a way for us to be able to see it and, and, and make sense of all those data points. So the first discovery um, that was published in 2008 was by a laboratory, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Whitfield out in Dartmouth. And he was the first person to pioneer this approach where they took skin biopsies, they looked at the gene expression, and they identified five molecular subsets of scleroderma. So I showed you that there's two subsets when we <coughs> clinically look at you, so the limited versus the diffuse patients, that's what we can see clinically. But when we look at your skin, looking at gene expression from the biopsies, he identified five groups. So this diffuse, the inflammatory, the limited, and the normal-like groups. And this diffuse one and diffuse two group subsequently became called a fibroproliferative group. And when they looked at the, um, the pathways that were associated with each of these different groups, there was this one group um, that was called the inflammatory group. And they, the genes that were deregulated in this particular group involved inflammation. So immune response, response to pathogens or bugs, and lymphocyte proliferation. So lymphocytes are one of the types of white blood cells in your body that are responsible for keeping you healthy. And so that was very intriguing. There was this one group you know, involving inflammation. And so I was just coming into science. I had been trained as a physician, but I was interested in conducting patient-focused uh, research. And so after this meeting, I thought, well, 
there, it, would there be a way to use this information to help me and other doctors select therapy for patients? So as Dr. Varga mentioned, we've got cyclophosphamide, we've got the C82, we've got mycophenolate. There's all these different drugs that are coming into use for patients with scleroderma. And basically, we don't really have a good way of picking the drug for the appropriate patient. So I knew um, that there was a drug called mycophenolate mofetil or Celsept. This is what it looks like. This is how it looks like molecularly. It's an immunosuppressive agent, and it is known to decrease or attenuate lymphocyte proliferation. And it's been FDA approved for autoimmune diseases. It's used for treatment, and it was in a clinical trial, and I thought, Going back two slides, if there's a group of you that have this inflammatory deregulated signature in your skin, and there's a drug that targets lymphocytes that we know about, it stands to reason that the patients that have this inflammation signature in their skin might be the most likely patients to respond to NMF. So we designed a trial. It was uh, funded by the NIH with the National Institutes of Health. So they funded me to do this research. We recruited patients that are in this audience that underwent biopsies, skin biopsies at baseline, six months, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months. You all have track marks up your arms um, from the skin biopsies that I took from you. And but what we found was that the people that improved uh, during the cell step treatment, so here's, here's what a skin score of three looks like, where there's lots of fibrosis. You can see all this pink tissue is fibrotic tissue. And so people who went from a skin score of three down to a skin score of two, you can see it's a little bit less bound down here. Um, those patients, for the most part, were part of this inflammatory group. So they had the inflammatory skin gene expression signature in their skin, and they were the ones that got better during treatment. Versus the non-improvers, the people who got worse, and you can see here's a person who started out with a skin score of two, and during treatment, their skin score actually increased to a skin score of three, they were more likely to be in this fibroproliferative group. There were also some healthy patients in this normal light group who responded. So the responders are the improvers are blue. So anybody who was blue, you can see there were some blue people in the normal light group. But most of the blue people are in this inflammatory group. So that kind of that was in keeping with our hypothesis that if you have lots of inflammation in your skin and you give the patient a drug that targets inflammation, they're the ones who are going to get better versus a patient who has more of a fibrotic signature in the skin. You give them an anti-inflammatory drug and they're not they're not as likely to get better. Now this is plagued by the sense that we didn't have any control people. So the people that got better could have gotten better just from the from their own improvement. It wasn't necessarily MMF that made them better, but I didn't feel like it was ethical for me to recruit patients into the study and not give them treatment. So that was why I didn't include an untreated control group, which is the perfect study design. But sometimes we can't do the perfect study because we don't think it's ethical. So the next thing that we looked at, um, we looked at people, we looked, so this was a retrospective study like Dr. Favali Bostwick mentioned where we looked back, I did the clinical trial and then I looked back at the data that I had and I found that um, there were people who stopped the, the drug at two years indicated by this hatched line here and their, their inflammation signature as indicated here, this inflammatory, this stands for normalized enrichment score. So this normalized enrichment score rebounded in some of the patients after we stopped MMF at two years. Versus there were some patients who we spoke in clinic and you know they said, I'm really doing well, I don't want to come off my MMF, it's working, why would we stop it? And so we decided to continue it. And they had this increased reduction in their normalized enrichment score over time. And so that, that gives us in a sense that perhaps two years of MMF is not long enough and that maybe we should continue treatment longer. And that's basically a d discussion that I have with every patient with MMF at every visit. You know, if they're doing well and they're not having any side effects and they still feel like the drug is benefiting them, sometimes we decide to continue it. And some patients, you know, they're of the opinion, I don't want to be on these immune suppressive agents, I want to come off it as soon as possible. So it's, it's, a, it's a decision that you make one-on-one -on -one with your doctor. But this is just to show you that there are data 
And there's interesting data that can be obtained from looking at the study after the study is completed. So this is, uh, we're trying to get this published. Um, it's in revision right now. So the next question we had was, how can we enable doctors and patients to make informed treatment decisions? Um, so I would say that to answer this, it takes the government and the village. So this was another study that we did in conjunction with investigators at Stanford, um, Shane Lofgren and Pravesh Khatri, and countless uh, scleroderma patients throughout the country as well as uh, clinician scientists. So we went to this thing, this database called the National Center for Biotechnology Information Gene Expression Omnibus. So that's what this stands for. And these are publicly available gene expression data. So these are data that you know, will be generated and all the scientists in America are required to put their data into these public databases so that other scientists can use the data to make discoveries. So using um, four data sets that were published and in this, in this database that's funded by the government, um, we divided it into two groups. So we used two groups as the discovery data set and then two groups as, the, uh, as part of the validation. And then we recruited another three scientists in the United States to give us their sample data from their samples so that we could validate what it is that we were finding. So every good discovery is interesting, but it has to be validated before we take it to patients. We don't wanna you know, take patients, take data to patient care until it's been validated. So we took all the, the data in these two uh, publicly available data sets, so that was 158 patients skin samples, and we identified a 415 gene signature that was associated with skin disease, and then we validated that using five independent data sets. So that's your government dollars at work. And what we found in the discovery cohorts, so you can see these two cohorts from um, University of California, San Francisco, and Boston, this was the data that we used for the discovery. So this is what all the skin gene expression looked like here. And then we validated it in these other five cohorts. So you can see it validated pretty well. This looks pretty reminiscent of this. And again, this is this 415 gene, skin gene signature that's associated with scleroderma skin disease. So, and there were, two, there were 120 overexpressed and 66 underexpressed that validated out of the 415. So we took 415 and out of those 286 were legit, statistically speaking. So next we, we wanted to see, okay, well what can we do with this information? We have these 415 genes, about 300 of which validated. What can it tell us about uh, informing our medical decision making? And what we found is when you look at this, when you do this principal component analysis, it's called, it's a way of looking at high dimensional data. So it's a way of like that heat map where you know the red and the green I showed you earlier on in the talk, remember the big rectangle? So that's a way of viewing lots of data. This is another way of viewing lots of data in a way that you can make sense of it, your eye can make sense of it. So here's the normal or healthy control people like myself and Mary and all, all the people that work in scleroderma. So we're all the black dots here. And you can see all of these patients here, you're all the red dots. And the size of your sphere is related to the, the, uh, the height of your skin score and how high your skin score is. So the bigger the circle, the higher the skin score for that individual patient. <coughs> And what we noticed is that there seemed to be like this distance to health. So the higher your skin score is, the further you are away from the black dots from the patient, from the health control individuals. And so that was interesting. Um, so we decided to take all the black dots, turn them into, we colored them green here. And so we had this healthy sphere, we call it the green like orb of health. And so we measure um, the distance from you that you are to this healthy sphere. And so you can see this is patient six, so this may be one of you in the audience, and their baseline skin score was 16, as indicated here in parentheses. And so at six months, their skin score was 11, 
And then at 12 months, it stayed 11, so kind of stayed here. And at 24 months, it moved closer to the orb of health with the skin score of nine. And then we took this patient off Cellcept because the patient and I made the decision that it was a good time to stop the drug. And the patient, you can see, rebounded. Their skin score went up to 20, and their sphere moved <coughs> further away from health. <coughs> Patient 17, this is just another example, you can see the baseline skin score of 35, the six month skin score of 35, so they essentially stayed the same. But then look, they made this huge jump between six months and 12 months. Um, their, skin, their skin gene expression really changed. Those, you can see this dot going to this dot, but the skin score really didn't change very much. They only went from a 35 to a 31, so just four point decrease, but the skin gene expression was really changing. And then you can see 24 months, 19, again, a big decrease in the skin score with a small change in gene expression. And this told us that the gene expression in the skin changes before the skin score changes. And that makes sense, right? Because when you think of when you get a cut in your arm and you get a scar, it takes about a year for your body to get rid of the scar, to dissolve the scar tissue. So we, we can infer from this that the gene expression changes long before you start to notice the improvement in the skin and because it takes so long for our bodies to dissolve collagen. So that gave us an idea that this, the gene expression might be a biomarker. It might be telling us something about the patient's skin disease before we can pinch it. Um, so it might be a way to predict what's happening to patients. Is everybody with me? I know this is kind of deep. Okay. Um, so we call this the distance to health. And this was all very well and good um, because, you know, it, it was interesting and it was exciting and it was a way to get away from the pinch test. We could now do a more scientific approach using gene expression and skin. But this is retrospective, right? This is. You know, we do all the biopsies at all these different time points, and then we look, we do all this fancy analysis with principal component analyses. Is there a way that we could, with you, the patient before me, take the biopsy, measure the gene expression, and tell, tell you something in a more real-time way? And so that's why we started looking at uh, ways of doing that. So we, after much, 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 many months of, uh, of trial and error, we figured out a way, if we took the mean of the 211 genes that were <coughs> overexpressed, and we subtracted the means of the genes that were underexpressed for that, for that 415 gene signature, we came up with something called the 4S, which we call it the Slurderma Skin Severity Score. And that was a way that we could real time, more real time, uh, tell patients something about their skin disease as they're experiencing it. So what we found is that this 4S, the change in the 4S from your baseline to 12 months, so if we took a biopsy at you at baseline, and then we took a biopsy from your skin at 12 months, and we measured the gene expression change between those time points, that would tell us what your skin score was most likely to be, your modified rounded skin score, the pinch test, at 24 months. So this is the first time that we were able to find a biomarker that could predict what your skin score would be. Before that, it was always like, eh, your guess is as good as mine. I mean, the antibodies helped us. We knew that patients with RNA polymerase 3 positivity, for instance, had much greater risk of, of having bad skin disease. But it was always kind of nebulous. We never knew that for sure. That's just, in gen generally speaking, patients with the RNA Pol 3 have worse skin disease. So this is the first kind of scientific um, study that we were able to conduct that showed that measuring the change in gene expression could predict what your skin would be at 24 months. So we were excited by this. And this was published in a journal in, uh, last year in 2016. So the next question we said, does the 415 gene skin signature suggest a cause for SSC skin disease and maybe could lead us to new treatments? So Dr. Fogali Bostwick um, eloquently uh, spoke this morning about the, you know, the genetic background, the epigenetic background of scleroderma, the environmental causes. Um, what, what about on the molecular basis? Could we use skin gene expression to determine what are the pathways that are go awry in our bodies. So that was our next question. Again, we turned to a publicly 
funded uh, NIH government sponsored um, database called Links. And this is a really cool database if, for, if you're bored on a Saturday night and you want to get on your computer and hack on down. And you can look at 17 different cells. So they use all these different cell lines. Most of them are cancer cell lines that they've gotten from patients. And these people, these scientists, they take a cell line, they grow it, and then they add in a growth factor or some kind of uh, way to stimulate the cell. And then they measure the gene expression. And they just keep doing that with growth factor after growth factor after growth factor after growth factor. Um, and they put all of these data up onto this database so that investigators can say, okay, I have this 415 gene signature from my scleroderma folks. What, pat, what cells that have been stimulated by which different molecules look like our signature, look like you, look like your skin? So we did that, we can do that. And we found that um, here were the here were the ligands. Here were the uh, molecules that were stim that they that these investigators used to stimulate their cell lines. And we found this is the correlation with our 415 gene signature. So we found these EGF-like growth factor, histidine-rich glycoprotein, epiregulin minor extracellular protease, beta cellulin epidermal growth factor. So we, 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 we dug into these. We didn't even know what some of these were, but we, we identified them and we looked into them. And what they all had in common was that they were related to epidermal growth factor. That's all of these different uh, genes are all involved in the epidermal growth factor pathway. So that was really intriguing because we haven't really been thinking about that pathway in scleroderma very much. And so uh, is epidermal growth factor important in scleroderma? That was our next question. And so to that, I went to the freezer and I took out all of your sera that you've been giving me. So every time you go get a blood test and Mary or Kathleen come, can we get some blood? Can we take a tube of your blood? So we took that all that, we went to the freezer, we took out all the blood that we had collected and we measured epidermal growth factor receptors. So we measured the receptor in the sera that, that you have given us. And we found that the levels for you all, in 100 of you, was less, statistically significantly less, than the levels that we had measured in healthy controls. So, it's, so you all have lower epidermal growth factor receptors in your sera compared to people that don't have scleroderma. We, did, we partnered up with a private company called Olink to do these analyses. So that was interesting. And then we looked at, well, what's the relationship between epidermal growth factor receptor levels and your skin score? So we looked at that. So we went to the computer where all the skin scores had been charted, and we compared the skin score to the uh, EGFR receptor, and we saw that there was an inverse correlation. So the higher your skin score, the lower your epidermal growth factor receptor level. So that's intriguing. It might mean something. So then we went to the literature and we're like, well, who else has been looking at this? We're probably not the only ones who stumbled upon this. And there's, there's other reports in the literature, but this is a recent publication just from 2014, and this is a Canadian group. They have their Canadian scleroderma research group up in Canada. And they have published this interesting study that uh, systemic sclerosis immunoglobulin, so these autoantibodies that you have in your blood, induces growth and a pro-fibrotic state in vascular smooth muscle cells. So those are those cells inside the blood vessel wall that Dr. Kahigas was mentioning. And they signal through epidermal growth factor receptor. So that's really exciting. Um, because that's an, an, a novel pathway that we hadn't thought about. Um, and so currently, we are taking animal models of scleroderma, and we're giving them drugs that target the epidermal growth factor receptor and that pathway. There's a lot of them that are available. Um, they're used in cancer therapies. So this would be something like Dr. Varga spoke about earlier, the repurposing of an FDA-approved drug. So it's been developed, it's cost billions of dollars for the cancer people to invent the drug and test it. Now we're gonna steal it and use it for scleroderma <laughs> patients and repurpose it, and we won't have to spend those billions of dollars. We'll just have to do a smaller study and perhaps test it in patients. 
if the results of the animal models are you know, promising. So again, we never take a discovery that we make, um, although it's exciting, we never take it right to patients. We always first do it in cell lines and animal models to make sure that it you know, does what we think it's gonna do and that it appears to be safe. And then once we validate it in animal models, then we can take it into the clinic and design a clinical trial. So that's why we rely on the support from the Scleroderma Foundation to be able to do these preliminary studies before we take drugs that could be potentially harmful into clinical trials to, in order to see if they're gonna be helpful in patients. So that is the, uh, the end. Um, the summary is that measuring gene expression in skin does appear to be a biomarker. It's at least a promising uh, avenue for research. We have this 415 gene signature that we identified in the skin of these nerve patients that again, we're still validating and testing, but it looks promising. We have this scleroderma uh, skin severity score, the 4S, that appears to be predictive of future change in your skin disease. We've identified an EGF or EGFR pathway that is a new potential area that we could target. And we're doing experiments uh, right now as we speak. The mice you know, are being treated with uh, these drugs. Um, and we're going to see if it helps with the mouse skin and the mouse lung. And then we'll let you know about that next year. So uh, thank you to all the people who are involved in this research. It certainly is not the work of myself. Um, you all know uh, the doctors who collect the skin biopsies, who take care of you in clinic, Dr. Corman, Dr. Varga. Um, there's talented people in the laboratory. There's uh, the clinical coordinators that hound you all to get all of the specimens from you and consent you. Um, we've got bioinformaticians, biostatisticians, RNA experts, cardiology colleagues, gastroenterologists. There's tons of people who um, have participated in this research and helped to provide you with the best care that is available. So uh, thank you to all of them. I'm going to take this daughter. I'm meeting her right now. To, she's going into high school next year. And I have to meet her right now to go look at an open house at a high school. So I'm off to, to tour high schools with her. So I won't be around uh, later today, but I um, hopefully will have an opportunity to meet you all in the future and answer questions now, if that's good, good by you. So thank you very much for your attention.